towels, swabs, t-shirts, and paper. It's a material that's used in so many different products. But do you know where the cotton in your favorite jeans came from? On this field trip, we'll explore an industry that produces a fabric that's probably in your closet right now, cotton. Field Trip is made possible by Cooperative Extension Service at New Mexico State University and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Did you know that America is the third largest cotton producer in the world? Cotton is essentially the fabric of America. Not only is it used in clothing, but it's used in several other products as well. The cotton industry is weaved together with a network of farmers, cotton gins, and clothing manufacturers. The process begins with the cotton fields and ends with the retailer who sells you your jeans. There are a lot of people in the chain, uh, a lot of people starting from, from selling the seed, uh, producing the seed, to planting, growing, harvesting, ginning, transporting the bales, uh, marketing, you know, just a lot, a lot of people are involved in the cotton industry. It's a very important part of the United States ag scene. But it's also just an interesting industry to see uh, how um, something goes from the field and uh, goes through processing at a gin and then gets made into fabrics or into other products and how it ends up on your shelf at home. Cotton is extremely important. What's nice about cotton is that in the summertime when it's hot, it breathes. So cotton is a very good product to have. What I love the most about wearing cotton is the ease in wearing it. It's not hard to take care of and you just feel cool and comfortable all the time. Cotton has been an important resource for man since prehistoric times. It's native to the Americas, as well as other tropical and subtropical regions spanning the globe. Upon discovering the New World, European explorers found native people wearing garments made of cotton. Industry expanded in the United States, especially in the South, where cotton became a source of contention during the American Civil War. Today, the United States is the leading exporter of raw cotton, making it one of the most important agriculture crops in our country. Centuries ago, there are some native cotton varieties to the United States. There was some uh, small patches of cotton uh, in uh, central Arizona, as well as some small varieties over in the uh, far east coast of the United States. And in the Southwest, uh, the Indians did utilize some of these cottons in their culture, and that's how we know some of their existence. But uh, they were in such small patches and really didn't survive uh, in the long run. And so there were just a few plants by the time the U U.S. Department of Agriculture started looking for them uh, in 1900, 1910, 1920. A lot of you have probably heard in, in high school history that, that now this is, this is a lock of seed cotton fiber and seed that before Eli Whitney, people sat around and, and gin for cotton like this, just pull the fiber off the seed one by one like that and, there, and you had a you know this kind of thing that never really happened people didn't really do that at least not to any extent if you ever try this your, it doesn't take too long your fingers get real sore but ginning primarily is, is the, just the separation of fiber and seed what we actually did before Eli Whitney was they used stands like these now this is called a churka and as you look at it this is like the old Maytag ringer washer it's got two wooden rolls here. What happened is, is, is a person would stand on this leg here, would crank this wheel uh, like this, around this way, you can see there's some hand cut gears, would feed the seed cotton in on this side and the fiber would be pulled through here and the seed would drop out the back, like the old Maytag Ringer washer. Now these were not really high capacity gins, as you think about, but you could gin a few pounds a day on these. And what happened before Eli Whitney was that actually the United States, they would make banks of these, there are drawings where 
there may be like four of these machines in one box and they were powered by water wheels or human power or dog, you know, dog power, the treadmills, you know, different ways because it doesn't take a lot. But again, they were very slow and it was a very hand, you know, labor was cheap, uh, but it was a way of ginning. Well, along came Eli Whitney. Now, he was a lawyer. He was not an engineer. He grew up in a part of the country, though, where there was manufacturing. He put together a patent which was issued in 1794. It was a spike tooth gin. It wasn't really a saw gin like we have today. This is somewhat representative of what Whitney developed. It's about half the size, probably, of, of Eli Whitney's uh, original stand. So, but what's inside here are saws. And as you open this up so that you can see where the roll box is, the seed cotton is down in here, and these saws rotate this direction. And the saws grab a hold of the fiber. They don't cut. They grab a hold of the fiber, and the fiber is pulled through these slots, and the seed can't go. So the seed drop out the bottom, the fiber goes out the back, and that's the ginning operation. There are several varieties of cotton. You've probably heard of Egyptian cotton used in high-end sheets or towels. But have you heard of Upland or Pima cotton? Upland is a, is a uh, hirsutum variety. It has a fuzzy seed, if, if, if anyone's interested. It gets down to the nitty-gritty. Pima cotton, the difference between Pima and, or Barbadense, the variety is Barbadense, and Upland cotton is the, is the length of fiber and the strength of fiber and the fineness of the fiber. Uh, Pima cottons are what go into real uh, high-end goods, high-quality textiles, fine sheeting, a lot of those kinds of things. To grow a productive crop, farmers need a cotton variety with important traits like high yield and fiber quality. So it's up to researchers to develop cotton breeds with these ideal characteristics. We serve the cotton ginner and the cotton farmer. That's what we're here for. And the way we do that is uh, we, we look at the ginning process, and the ginning process has a lot to do with the quality of the cotton that the farmer eventually has to sell. So we're continually trying to improve that quality. The quality of the cotton fiber uh, is, is at its top when that bowl opens in the field. It's the best it's going to get. And then we start machine harvesting it, and we handle it, we bring it to the gin, we separate fiber and seed. Every one of those steps has a potential of decreasing uh, quality. It doesn't have to, but it can. So our particular call here is to look at the entire ginning process, either individual machines or the process as a whole. We, we have developed new machines, we, we uh, improve processes, we do all kinds of things. We uh, work with everyone from the cotton breeder to evaluate new varieties coming up to the textile industry to evaluate how ginning affects their processes. Cotton begins with planting seeds like these, but sometimes things don't go as planned. The weather is unpredictable and can determine when cotton is planted and harvested. The weather uh, affects everything we do on the farm. If uh, we're, we're planting and we get some rain and uh, uh, gets a little too wet, we got to shut down because it builds up on the wheels and starts mudding and it affects the depth and uh, integrity of your seed furrow and everything. So. Weather is something that always affects the farm. If it's, it's hard to, to go out there and farm, but uh, it rains on the just and the unjust. So we need it sometimes, and, and, but the ranchers need it all the time. So even if we're getting rain and it's stopping us in the field, there's someone out there getting it that needs it. A rule of thumb for me is I always try to be planting somewhere around April 15th on cotton. Because if them ground temperatures on the cotton are not there, uh, around 57 to 60 degrees um, and the seed's just not going to germ, it's not going to sprout so with this cold spring that we've had this year I've, I've backed off about a week, week and a half and uh, I start planting and you see what we're getting. We're getting this inclement weather, the temperatures probably dropped what 25 degrees today. You got to time that moisture, the ideal thing is to plant the seed in moisture and get it up on moisture before you have to water it. So you time that first pre-irrigation and the time you're planting where you got enough uh, moisture in the ground to plant it 
and you put a cap on it and then you drag that cap off when it's in the crook and once it, you, like this is the plant, you drag it off right there and then it just pops out of the ground. Farmers rely on the land for cotton production. They must irrigate the fields and prevent pests from ruining the crops they work so hard to grow. Well, it's going to be probably from the month of April, April to early May, and then uh, it'll finish out probably in November to December. It, it takes that long pretty much, so it's it's fairly lengthy crop. Total water, you're probably looking at about 36 to 40 inches of water. There again, depending on soil type and some factors. Typically, there's some fertilizer, um, possibly before the cotton is planted, you know, a pre-plant type deal. Some guys may go out with some, uh, uh, typically they're more of a, a phosphorus, phosphate type uh, material to stimulate some root, root activity. And then in season, you know, they'll put some nitrogen down. Most of these fields are probably, mm, probably one, one insecticide application per season is, or, or none is typical. There is, we're pretty in a pretty good spot right here. Um, for as far as cotton is growing, as far as the amount of pesticide used. Cotton has a long growing season. Fibers and seeds develop in a pod called a bowl. These fibers and seeds emerge from flowers like these. Once they open up, the cotton plant is fully developed and ready for harvest. Okay, what we have here is a cotton bowl. And in the, uh, early in the year, what we do is we plant the cotton seed and the cotton plant grows. And as it matures, it flowers. And once it flowers and is pollinated, then we get what we call a bowl forming here. And you can see the brown parts here. That was originally in the bowl. And as it's split open, it's formed these five different chambers and all this cotton just expands and expands, kind of like foam coming out of a container. That's why we use machines to harvest. This is our cotton picker. Uh, this is a six row picker, so it can pick up to uh, six rows of cotton. What this machine does is it, uh, it'll go through the rows. The cotton comes in through here into the spindles. Those spindles turn and grab a hold of the cotton itself. These are your moisture pads. Moisture is dropped into these pads to uh, moisten the spindles as the apparatus is going counterclockwise to prevent matting of the cotton while going into the machine. These spindles, after they're lubricated and are attached to the cotton, come through these doffers in here where the cotton is removed from the spindles into this area where there's a large amounts of air flowing through here. That air pushes the cotton up in through these tubes and into the basket. 